Well, hello and welcome everybody to what I think is going to be a slightly unusual episode of All The Gear No Idea. And this time I can say for sure I've got absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Now because this video does actually feature the day job and some of my working life, and more in particular that it does show some products that are in development at the moment, there's not really very much that I can say about it or discuss with you. And for that reason it's quite likely that I will disable comments on this particular video, but that's just a one-off for this video. Well 90% of my day job just consists of shuffling pieces of paper from one side of my desk to another. But on occasions, in between all this vitally important paper shuffling, I do occasionally get the opportunity to design something. So what we're going to be looking at today is what they call EMC testing, which stands for Electromagnetic Compatibility. When you're designing a piece of equipment, and especially one that you hope to sell lots of, it's important to make sure that that piece of equipment operates correctly in the real world. So the reason that we do this EMC testing is to ensure that my piece of equipment won't interfere with any other pieces of kit that are out there. And also importantly, I don't want other people's equipment to actually interfere with mine and potentially they could stop it from working, which would be bad. Now as part of the design process, we'll probably be building some prototypes, and of course we can actually do some in-house testing on those prototypes, but there does come a point where you need some specialist equipment to do the full range of tests that you need to do. So today I'm going to be taking you to an EMC test house where we're going to be doing what they call pre-compliance testing, and that's actually just a bit of a finger in the air. We're just going to test the water to make sure that the piece of equipment isn't doing anything particularly nasty in terms of EMC. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to make sure that it isn't radiating any electromagnetic waves. So we do that by listening to it with aerials. We're also going to make sure that there's no noise coming out of the, uh, out of the wiring, all the connecting cables. And then we're also going to be doing some immunity testing, which is kind of hitting the piece of equipment with a big electric stick. And that stick comes in two forms. We're going to be using an RF stick, where we actually bombard the piece of equipment with RF energy and see if it falls over. And we're also going to fire some energy down the connecting cables into it and again and see if it falls over. So what we're going to be doing today is just some quick tests, and it isn't by any means the complete testing that we will be doing with the product, we'll be doing far more than that, but hopefully you'll get the gist of it. And if nothing else, you get to see some really nice test gear porn, which is always good, isn't it? So pretty much any kind of electrical equipment is actually going to generate some internal electrical noise. Now for any kind of mains powered equipment, you are of course going to have mains wiring which is connected between your equipment and the power grid. And the fact that you've got that mains wiring means that any electrical noise which is being generated by your piece of equipment, it has a way out, it has an exit. And what it can do is it can actually go down the mains wiring and it can possibly interfere with other pieces of equipment which are plugged in on the same supply. Now depending on the type of power supply that you have installed in your piece of equipment, it may not actually draw power from the mains over the complete sine wave. It might just draw it from portions of it. And that leads to something that they call harmonic distortion. And sometimes you'll be able to see that on the oscilloscope. Maybe rather than having a true sine wave, you'll see it'll maybe have a bit of a flat on one side or the top. Well that's something they called harmonic distortion. It's really more typical in switch mode power supply but you can also get harmonic distortion associated with conventional power supplies which have a transformer, diodes and capacitors. Now that type of distortion will be associated with when those diodes actually start to switch on and depending on the size of your smoothing capacitor you can actually draw quite a lot of current at a particular moment in time. Well that can be impressed on the incoming mains and lead to distortion of the sine wave. Now there's various reasons why these harmonic currents may be bad. Certainly your electrical supplier won't like the fact that you are distorting their lovely sine wave. But it can also cause interference to other pieces of equipment that might be sharing the same main supply. Or it can also affect things like circuit breakers tripping and fuses. So you can see our test set up here and the electrical supply to my piece of equipment, you can see it's being fed in by that red quick block that's on the test. But the electrical source is actually a very high powered amplifier. 
So the test house don't actually rely on the incoming mains to do the test because the incoming mains may be distorted or corrupted. So what they actually do is they actually generate their own AC mains. So you can see there you've got this piece of rack mounted equipment at the bottom and that's actually generating a very clean source of main supply and that's being used to power my equipment. So now that we know that our piece of test equipment is actually being fed by what is a perfect sine wave, if we actually get any distortion, that distortion must be coming from my piece of equipment. So what they actually do is, while they're running the test, they're actually sniffing my piece of equipment and they're actually looking, they're measuring the current which is being supplied to it and they're trying to see if the, uh, if the actual sine wave of the voltage matches the sine wave of the current. Now if there's any discrepancies between the two, that will be classed as harmonic distortion. Now the same piece of equipment that we use to measure the harmonic distortion can also be used to measure something called flicker. So harmonic distortion works at relatively high frequencies, it's multiples of the incoming mains, but flicker is a lower frequency event and we've all seen the effect of flicker because, well, it makes a light bulb flicker. So what we're actually looking for here is to see if my piece of equipment actually presents a varying load to the mains, because if it did it could actually result in lamps flickering. Is F3, is it? That's us. Now you may think that the ferrite rod in your transistor radio is pretty big but it's got nothing compared with this ferrite clamp which is used as part of the conducted immunity testing. Now unfortunately I missed the conducted immunity part of the testing but what they're doing in the basic form is they're injecting RF energy into the mains wiring and they're actually seeing if my equipment falls over and if it does fall over that's classed as a fail. So for the next part of our testing we actually went back to conducted emissions testing but it's a slightly different test this where they're actually looking for any interference which my equipment can put back onto the mains wiring. So they're not just looking for harmonics, they're actually looking for anything whatsoever, any, any radiation which is coming down the mains cabling, that's what they're looking for. And they use a very particular piece of equipment which you can see at the back there, it's something called a listen, the thing with the orange plug on it, that's a listen. And that stands for Line Input Stabilisation Network. Now it almost goes without saying that Line Input Stabilisation Network is somewhat of a mouthful and that's why they abbreviate it to the word LISTEN. Now it may sound complicated but actually a LISTEN is a fairly simple device and all that a LISTEN really consists of is just some inductors and some capacitors. Now part of the job of the LISTEN is actually to take a sample of any of the interference which is present on the mains cabling and it takes a sample of it and feeds it back to a spectrum analyzer which is actually used to do the test recording. But the LISTEN also performs a couple of other very important jobs. Now one of those jobs is actually to act as a filter. So if there's actually any mains noise which isn't coming from my equipment, well we don't want the measuring equipment to detect that and display it because uh, well, I'm going to get a bad reputation for something that isn't my problem. So part of the LISTEN's job is actually to act as a filter and help stop any other mains noise from getting into the analyzer equipment. But probably the most important job for the listen is, well, it's as the name suggests, it's Line Input Stabilisation Network. And really that's just a fancy way of saying that it controls the impedance of the mains wiring. And what I mean by that is you've got to imagine between your house and your supply transformer, you've got some wiring, haven't you? You've got quite a lot of cabling. Now that cabling has a resistance. Now, because we're actually working at AC, rather than calling it resistance, they actually call it impedance. 
impedance. So that's what we're talking about. We're really talking about the impedance of the cabling or the resistance of the cabling. Well, it's important that if I do a test here at this test house, they get the same results as maybe a test house in London or Birmingham or Australia for that matter. So what the listen's job is to do, it always presents the same mains input impedance to the device under test. And then we can be sure that when we're comparing results from one lab to another, they'll actually match each other. Now there's actually quite a few different types of listens and the type of listen that you use for your testing will depend on the type of equipment that you've actually manufactured. Now for example there's some listen devices which are designed to work on three phase power systems, some on single phase and you can also get listens which are designed to work on DC power supplies. So they would actually be very useful for, for example for measuring any noise coming out from your wall wart power supply. Now although it is relatively simple to build your own listen, there is actually a few problems using them at home. Now one of them is you can see that there is actually quite a large capacitor which is installed between the live conductor and ground. And what you'll find due to the large value of that capacitor you'll actually get some significant current flow between your live conductor and earth. And the problem is it will actually trip out your earth leakage circuit breaker so you may have to involve some shenanigans using isolation transformers and stuff like that. Another problem that you may have using a listen is that it's actually quite easy to damage your spectrum analyzer which is what you use to take the actual measurements and the problem is if you switch on and off your device under test you can get some high speed transients and they get coupled into the spectrum analyzer and they can actually damage it, damage the front end. So if you are going to use a listen, it's very important that you either buy or build your own transient suppressor. A lot of the testing that we're doing today, it's actually taking place in what they call a semi-echoic chamber. And basically that's just a big room which is metal lined. So all the walls are lined with metal, the floor is lined with metal, and even the ceiling is lined with metal. And all that is connected to a very good ground system. Now the purpose of that semi-echoic chamber is to make sure that no RF energy can actually leak into the room when we're doing our testing and affect the measurements. Now the door on our anechoic chamber is also made out of metal, but it's important that we don't get any RF energy leaking in through any gaps that may be around the door. So you can see that the door frame here, it's got these little copper fingers which actually go all around the door frame. So when the door is shut, these copper fingers actually press against the door and they make sure that the door is earthed as well. Now this door is actually very heavy and it requires quite a lot of clamping pressure to shut it. So you can see that the hinges and actually the door lock mechanism, they really are quite substantial. Come on, fingers crossed. We need fingers crossed for the first bit. Well out of filter territory. Oh, good. Filtering normally be here, filtering inductance, get to about here. Ferrites help us and get towards the end, earthing and ferrites. Now having gone to all the trouble of building this anechoic chamber, it's actually very important that we don't have any electrical noise sources in the room where we're doing the testing. And in fact the only piece of equipment that should be in the anechoic chamber is actually the piece of equipment that's undergoing the test. So the spectrum analyzer and in fact the computer system that we're using here, that's actually located outside of the anechoic chamber. So what we're looking at next is something called electrostatic discharge. How does static electricity work? It's an imbalance between negative and positive charges in objects. You have probably experienced it yourself when you pulled off a woolen sweater. Well, that's electrostatic energy. In practice, this could be bad, like when touching electronic parts or even people. Well I know that everybody watching has got experience of the next test that we're going to be doing because I'm sure that everybody here has walked along a nylon carpet and then touched a metal doorknob and received a little electric shock. So what happens is when you walk along the nylon carpet you actually act a bit like a capacitor and you become charged up with static electricity and then when you touch a metal object that's grounded instantly all that charge that you've built up suddenly becomes discharged and goes to ground. So we're actually using a piece of equipment here called an electrostatic discharge gun and that actually simulates a human body becoming charged up and then touching a finger against a piece of equipment. How many times do you have to do it? Ten. Ten. Is it sapper?
6 kb as well. We're rattling in at top. Now there's a couple of different types of tests we do. For some of the tests the electrostatic discharge gun is actually pressed against the panel and for other tests it's actually held a few centimetres away and the actual static discharge is allowed to jump onto the panel. The next part of the testing that we looked at was something called radiated emission. Now I can promise that everybody watching this video has actually had problems due to radiated emission. So what is radiated emission? Well if you have a piece of equipment you want to make sure that it's not giving off radio waves that could affect another piece of equipment. So a good example of radiated emission is when you're driving along in the car and you've got your mobile phone on the dashboard and every now and again you'll hear through your car stereo speakers you'll hear some interference some bleeping and you, you'll all know that that's coming from your mobile phone and it's coming from the mobile phone every time it re-establishes communications with the base tower so you'll, you'll hear it as a series of bleeps coming through on the car audio so in this case your mobile phone is emitting some RF radiation and your car stereo which obviously isn't designed to pick up mobile phone broadcasts it's actually picking them up and it's picking them up as interference and uh, you know distorting the program that you want to listen to so if, like me, you are manufacturing a piece of equipment, it's very important that that piece of equipment doesn't actually unintentionally transmit on any frequency because it could actually interfere with people's mobile phones or it could interfere with emergency mobile communications like police or aeroplanes or stuff like that. Or maybe in a severe case, it could actually stop some piece of equipment working. So it's actually very important that you don't have your piece of equipment radiating RF energy. In today's modern electronics, we generate an awful lot of RF noise. So here's a very inexpensive way of tracking down mains noise. Now, this is actually a radio, as you can see, it's a little cheap two pounds Chinese radio. And, uh, equipment will give off electric fields it actually gives off an electric field and a magnetic field well because this has got a ferrite rod antenna inside it it's more likely going to be sensitive to what the magnetic field is given off by a piece of equipment but we can still use it to give a bit of an indication of whether something is a noise generator so behind me i've got a bright light which you can probably see giving me a halo effect around me well i'm just going to put this radio near the light and you're going to see the effect of the uh, of the magnetic radiation that's actually being given off by this lamp. So you can see behind me that I've got a computer monitor and I'm actually using that to edit this video. But if we actually put our radio near to the monitor, you can actually see that it's actually giving off a fair amount of electromagnetic field. But I can also tell that that's the magnetic field because it actually dies off relatively quickly if I move away. And even the camera that I'm using to make this video is giving off electromagnetic radiation. And of course it isn't just big pieces of mains equipment that can cause interference. Here's a little tiny Casio calculator. Hopefully you can hear that, now I've switched it on. Let's see if I can switch it off again. So now we're back in the test lab, we're actually going to have a look at the radiated emissions that my control panel is giving off. Now before when I was holding up my little transistor radio, that was actually sensitive to the magnetic field and they call that the near field or the H field. But in this test it's a little bit different. What we're actually looking for is we're looking for the radio emission, we're looking for the electric field. So it is a slightly different test than what we were doing previously. So you can see there at the end of the room there's quite a large receiving antenna. So that's going to be picking up any radio waves which are being emitted from my control panel. Now the type of antenna that they're using is something called a log periodic and basically what that means it's a very wide band antenna and the really special thing about it is it's been characterised and what that means is the people at the test house know what the gain is for all the different frequencies that the antenna can work at. So it's therefore very important that the receiving antenna only picks up radio waves that are given off from my panel. So the whole test takes place in a big screened room. So again we've got metal ceilings and a metal floor and metal walls and even the door 
is a very big metal door which is well screened. Now on top of the normal screening you can probably also see that there's some cone shapes. Now those are actually kind of made out of polystyrene which is loaded with carbon powder. Now the purpose of that radio frequency absorbing material it's actually to absorb any radio frequencies that are given off by my panel because if you're not careful what will happen is inside that screen room the various RF signals will bounce around and they can mix with each other and they can cause false readings. So they only want to receive radio waves from the actual piece of equipment the antenna is pointing at. They don't want to receive it as a reflection off the walls or any other surface. So that's why we have these large radio frequency absorbing cones installed everywhere. Now you can also see that we've got some white pieces that look like white polystyrene blocks but again they're actually made from special RF absorbing materials. So the antenna itself is actually mounted on a special radio mast and it can be raised up and down but as well as being raised up and down to various different heights it can also be rotated through 90 degrees. First of all they will use the antenna in the vertical plane to listen for any radio interference and then they'll rotate the antenna into the horizontal plane and they'll repeat the test again. Now interestingly enough it's not just the antenna that can be moved around. My actual control panel is actually mounted on a turntable and as they're doing these frequency sweep that turntable will rotate around through 360 degrees so they actually get to see my panel from every possible angle. Outside of the anechoic chamber we've got a very sensitive spectrum analyzer and that's connected to the receiving antenna. The spectrum analyzer takes quite a number of frequency sweeps and all that data is actually stored and then displayed on a computer system. Now on the computer system you can actually see what they call the limit lines in red. So those are the threshold which we must not exceed. We do two frequency sweeps. We do one up to a gigahertz and then we do one between one gigahertz and six gigahertz. Now the high frequency requires a different type of antenna and you can see that it's basically got a, a cone shape on the problem of reflected waves is worse at higher frequency. So to stop reflected waves from the floor we've actually installed this RF absorbing matting all around the receiving antenna and all the way up to my panel and the test. Now you can see that the limit lines are actually printed on the graphs and those are the limits which we mustn't exceed and if we do exceed those limits it's a fail but as hopefully you can see we actually did very well and everything was well below the limit line. This is another immunity test and it's designed to simulate power surges coming in on the power supply wiring. So there's a number of things that can generate these power surges. For example, if you're switching on large inductive loads like large transformers or big three phase motors. And a great problem where I live out in the country is that the power lines can get hit by lightning and all that surge current can actually enter your piece of equipment through the mains wiring and cause problems. So unlike the conducted immunity test that we did earlier, which was at relative high frequency but low power, these are at low frequency but the surges have a lot of power behind them. So normally when you go to a test house you'll maybe spend two or three days there and you'll find that these surge tests are amongst the last tests that they actually do and the reason that they do them last is potentially they're quite damaging and of course they don't want to damage your piece of equipment at the very start of the testing. Now when it comes to applying these surges there's a couple of different ways of doing it. The first method is to directly inject it into the power supply wiring and you can probably see here that my piece of equipment is directly connected to the transient generator. Now for my particular circuit when these surges are applied they're actually absorbed by the MOV devices and uh, there's only so much energy which the MOV devices can dissipate before they are damaged. So for that reason the test is actually done in a number of stages and what they allow for is the panel to rest for a minute between each test and that just allows everything to cool down before they apply the next set of surges. If your piece of equipment like mine uses quite a lot of connecting cables and those cables have quite long cable runs it's important that we actually try to apply these surges to every one of those different cables and the way they actually do that is by capacitively coupling them. It'll probably move around. Half a metre, which it, yeah, it is in fairness. So the last set of tests that we did was something called magnetic immunity testing. Now the standards to which my equipment is tested doesn't actually call up this magnetic immunity testing but the only reason we did it is that having booked the test house for the rest of today we just thought we might as well do it for a bit of a laugh and see if anything happened. 
So you can see that my panel is surrounded by a square frame and that's like a frame antenna in an old transistor radio. It's just got lots and lots of turns of wire within the frame. And that wire is connected to a generator. So they connect it to first an AC power supply and then they connect it to a DC power supply and they turn up the voltage to produce a certain amount of magnetic flux. And the magnetic flux is being measured by that yellow device that's on top of the panel. So as part of the test they have to move my panel around into a number of different planes because you could find that the electronics is more sensitive to the magnetic field in one plane than it is another, so they tend to rotate it. Now for the majority of equipment this test is going to be pretty benign and it isn't going to cause a problem and that was just the case for us in that we had no problems whatsoever with the magnetic immunity. Well today's episode of All The Gear No Idea was a little bit different so I'm hoping that some of you found it interesting and if you did please don't forget to like and subscribe because it does make a difference. So until next time I think that'll do. Thanks very much, hope to see you again very soon but until then bye for now. <laughs>